Warm welcome to the program. I'm Millicent Walker in Lagos. Ukraine's general staff of the armed forces says Russia is keeping up its targeted attacks on critical infrastructure across Ukraine. The capital of the Zaporizhia region continues to be a focal point for Russian fire now in its fifth day. Zaporizhia regional governor Alexander Sturek said several explosions were reported in the city overnight at infrastructure facilities causing fires. Russian forces have struck the regional capital and surrounding area continuously in recent days and weeks, creating concerns about the safety of the nearby nuclear power plant. According to the general staff, Russian force deployed crews, air-to-surface and anti-aircraft guided missiles, as well as Iranian-made attack on manned aerial vehicles uh, to carry out attacks. In the meantime, the United Nations nuclear watchdog, Chief Rafael Grossi, says he has raised the issue of the detained deputy head of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant with the Russian authorities. Speaking on a visit to Kyiv, Mr. Grossi said the detention of the plant's deputy director, Valery Matiuk, is unacceptable. Even as Grossi was speaking, an air raid siren was audible, but it did not interrupt the news conference. The IAEA chief has visited Kyiv and St. Pittsburgh in recent days in an attempt to get a demilitarized zone agreed. After a meeting with President Vladimir Putin, Mr. Grossi returned to Kyiv for more talks. He has repeatedly raised grave concerns in public of the fighting around the Zaporizhia plant and is trying to get Moscow and Kyiv to agree to a safety zone around the plant. <laughs> The United States Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, says that Russia had made a choice to attack Ukraine and could resolve the conflict by withdrawing. Speaking at a news conference after a NATO meeting in the Belgian capital of Brussels, Mr. Austin said NATO was more unified than ever. He reiterates NATO's commitment to Ukraine as well as its goal to strengthen NATO's collective defense. Austin also laid out plans to supply Kyiv with further defense systems following days of increased missile strikes across Ukraine, adding that Russia could choose to de-escalate the conflict unilaterally. In the face of Europe's largest security crisis since World War II, NATO stands more unified and more resolute than ever. Today, this proud alliance of free countries stands together to condemn Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. You know, Putin thought he could easily conquer his peaceful neighbor. Yet the Kremlin's war of choice is now in its eighth month. Putin's mobilization effort, his bellicose rhetoric, his cruel attacks on civilian targets and his hollow attempt to annex Ukrainian territory all show how Ukraine's courage and skill have disrupted Russia's hope for a quick war of conquest. NATO continues to make clear that we will not be dragged into Russia's war of choice, but we will stand by Ukraine as it fights to defend itself. And we will continue to strengthen NATO's collective defense. I would also say that one change that could be made today is that Russia could uh, choose to de-escalate and could choose to end this war because uh, Putin started this war by, uh, as a matter of choice. In terms of new systems that are being uh, that we are focused on providing, as you know, we, we're providing systems that can meet the immediate, the immediate needs. Uh, and we're also uh, procuring systems that will take longer to, uh, to produce and, and, and introduce into the, uh, into the theater. Uh, some of these systems could take weeks or months. Other systems may take years. For example, uh, you heard us mention uh, a couple of days ago that we're going to provide Ukraine with 18 additional HIMARS. We'll purchase those, we purchase those HIMARS, but it'll be a couple of years before they're actually produced and introduced. In the meantime, uh, we've provided four HIMARS systems that can be that will be introduced uh, immediately, and that'll give them additional capability to the one to the capabilities that they have right now. And by the way, they've been using that capability very, very effectively. 
Well, Russia's government has ordered contractors to finish repairs to a key bridge linking annex Crimea to Russia by July 2023. The bridge was damaged by a blast last Saturday, which officials say left at least three people dead. Russia blames Ukraine for the attack, but Kyiv has not agreed nor denied it. The 19-kilometer bridge, Europe's longest, is a key supply route for Russian forces in Ukraine, but heavy goods vehicles are unable to use it. The explosion caused midway sections of two of the four carriageways of the bridge to collapse into the sea and also damage the railway line. Currently, lorries are forced to queue for a ferry in a process which is thought to take several days. The International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, says it shares the frustration about the incomplete access to prisoners of war in Ukraine. This comes after the president accused the Red Cross of inaction in upholding the rights of Ukrainian prisoners of war. Spokesperson for the ICRC, Alan Watson, says since February, the committee has been working to gain access to the prisoners. Zelensky's chief of staff issued an ultimatum to the ICRC to launch a mission within three days, or Kyiv authorities would do it themselves. More than 50 Ukrainian uh, uh, persons, prisoners rather, of war were killed in the attack at the Olenivka camp in July. Many of them soldiers who had defended the Azovstal steel mill in Mariupol before giving themselves up. We do share the frustration regarding our lack of access to uh, all prisoners of war held in the international armed conflict between Russia and uh, Ukraine. We have been working since February now to obtain access to check on the conditions and treatment of POWs and keep their families informed uh, about their loved ones. We have been able to visit hundreds of POWs on both sides, but there are thousands more who we have not been able to see, and we are concerned about their fate. The Third Geneva Convention obliges parties to an international armed conflict to grant the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross immediate access to all POWs and the right to visit them wherever they are held. Uh, we want to stress today uh, that our teams are ready on the ground and have been ready for months to visit the Olenivka penal facility and any other location where POWs are held. Uh, however, beyond being granted access by high levels of authority, this requires practical arrangements to materialize on the ground. We cannot access by force a place of detention or internment where we have not been admitted. Well, joining us for more on what's going on in Ukraine, uh, Dr. Michael Ogur is a senior lecturer, political science at the University of Babcock. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much for having me, Medicine. Doctor, let's begin. Um, what do you think you know, has changed in the Belarus's posture in this war? Because the latest comments now is that the country is on high alert amid border tensions. Yeah, um, so uh, the Belarusian state, you know, is um, one of the border states to Russia and Ukraine um, and a few other NATO countries, you know. Um, but it's important to understand the relationship between Belarus and Russia, all right? Um, of course, they have enjoyed a very, a very robust foreign relations. Um, in fact, uh, reports, recent reports show that uh, in 2021, um, foreign trade revenue uh, to Belarus, you know, was 49% from Russia. Uh, that's that's almost half, you know. So, so Russia constitutes a very huge chunk of um, Belarusian foreign relations. And of course, the current president of Belarus also, um, his presidency is supported by Russia because in 2020, I think, you know, there was there was a protest, a pro-democracy protest against uh, the president, and um, and um, backed by Russian forces, you know, that that that. Um, that protest was suppressed, you know. So there's just a whole lot of a whole lot of um, a whole lot of um, relationship, you know, that Belarus enjoys from Russia. And so I think they are obliged. Belarus is obliged now to support to support Russia in this in this war, um, which of course it appears, you know, from indications at least that we can see, it appears that Russia seems to be on the losing side uh, in this conflict. 
you know so all of russia's allies especially those that are very very um that are very beneficial you know from russia like belarus is you know are obliged to to support and so i think that this is just one of the tactics that belarus is is employing you know to position itself to be ready um for use by russia in advancing this war against um or this war in ukraine rather well, today we've heard from uh, Putin say that, you know, there is no further mobilization, but then he has warned of um, what he calls great catastrophe if NATO gets involved um, in this war. Mm. But then w w when we look at um, perhaps the back and forth, um, and this is the uh, Brittany Griner issue, and this is, you know, the U.S. and the um, Putin in this regards. Um, what do you make of the, mm -hmm. the back and forth that we're seeing? Because uh, Russia is saying that, you know, they haven't heard anything uh, from the United States. Yeah, um, and, and, and of course, uh, the President Putin also, I don't think, has made any statement, uh, you know, since um, August when the conviction, when the conviction was, was, was made. I don't think Putin has made any statement. In fact, um, a recent news I was reading um, said that Putin plans to have a discussion with Putin, uh, a bed and rather plans to have a discussion with Putin, you know, at the G20 summit holding sometime next month. All right. So I, but in, in, in the general ground of, uh, scheme of things, I think that um, Griner just happens to be a victim, you know, in this, in this tussle between the U.S. and Russia, particularly at this time when um, the U.S. is, is, is strongly opposing um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you know, and Griner just happens to be in the middle of it all. Um, I doubt that any 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 positive, um, you know, I, I doubt that there will be any positive outcome from whatever conversations Putin and Biden will have next month, uh, if that conversation holds. I doubt there will be any positive outcome because um, Russia has to score a point, you know, um, against the West in this in this in this uh, in this invasion, and particularly with the involve in the involvement of the West, you know. And I think that this is a very good. Um, it's a very good position that they are in now, you know, um, uh, with 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 Grana in custody, and I, I don't think they will let her go um, as easily as as we think that they would or they should. Let's talk about the politics of Saturday's dramatic explosion on the Kerch Bridge. There are many theories, but who do you think is responsible? Uh, you know that that um, that particular incident was, I think, a very huge mis calculation all right um of course like you mentioned um, ukraine has neither confirmed nor denied and that 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 puts a lot of pressure on ukraine as being the culprit because um i mean logic you know would also would also say that ukraine could have been the culprit in that bombing but uh, it is a miscalculation like i just said it's a miscalculation i mean because why would you want to provoke you know that 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 was a very huge act of provocation all right, but I would not also want to rule out the possibility of criminal elements, you know, um, being involved in this conflict because the conflict has lingered for so long. This is almost the ninth month, I think, or over or almost almost the tenth month now. Uh, so the, the conflict has lingered for quite a while, and um, there's a tendency that criminal elements, you know, and other kinds of non-state actors um, who are interested, who are who perhaps might be benefiting from the economy of this war. You know, have gotten involved, and um, perhaps one of such um, interested, you know, elements could have been um, responsible for that for that explosion. You know, but um, um, be that as it may, I I would not want to rule out completely the involvement of Ukraine or Ukraine knowing something about what happened on Saturday because um, that that was a very huge blow, you know, to Russia. And Russia, of course, has been responding in very many. Um, strikes and explosions on, in, on, on Ukrainian soil in the last um, one week, uh, but but while while there are speculations about about the corporate, you know, I wouldn't exonerate completely Ukraine. I think that the Ukrainian authorities have an idea of what happened um, on that Crimean bridge on Saturday. And flowing from that, since Monday, is Russia's attack on civilians an escalation across cities in Ukraine? Um, what's your assessment of how Ukraine itself and the troops are holding up? Uh, well, Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine is uh, Ukraine is it's more or less like the last born now. Uh, you know, you know, if a parent wants to treat their last born um, very, very, uh, very, very kindly, very, very supportively. You know, being supportive. So Ukraine is enjoying a lot of support from the West and allies, and I think that is what has been holding them up uh, so far in this in this war. 
All right. So while they are, of course, receiving a lot of kickback, you know, from Saturday's event, I think that they're still in a good position compared to the Russian side, uh, you know, especially with, with, recent, with recent assessments of, you know, how Russia has been doing so far in the war. I think Ukraine is still in a good position. But, um, of course, all along, it has always been innocent civilians, you know, property um, infrastructure that has been suffering um, the the brunt of this invasion. And of course, that will continue if nothing drastic is done uh, very soon. But I think that militarily wise, you know, in terms of combat readiness, I think Ukraine is still in a good, fairly good position, uh, regardless of, you know, the, uh, the, repressal, the repressal attacks um, falling from Saturday's bombing. I think that Ukraine, you know, is still, uh, is still combat ready, you know, at least to a very large extent. So we're hearing rumors that Russia's stock of weapons might be running low, uh, which is also why some people are of the view that's why Russia is calling for negotiations now. Do you agree? Mm. Uh, you know, um, in, initially when when this uh, when this invasion began, you know, I, I was of the opinion that at a point um, war weariness was setting. I mean, the parties would get would get exhausted. You know. Um, um, material-wise, human resource-wise, and every otherwise logistics and all of that, you know. And I think that is beginning to we're beginning to see that unfold now, um, with the mobilization of Russians um, to get involved in the war um, a few weeks ago, you know. And of course, like you have just said, the recent calls for Russia to um, to have a negotiation that that shows that you know um, either Russia is getting tired or Russia is is suffering some kind of losses that. Um, they are not com they are not comfortable to continue suffering uh, these kinds of, of things. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't want to to outrightly say that you know their military stockpile is is reducing uh, because I mean I would I would need to have sufficient evidence to back up that claim. But I think that you know Russia is not in the position that they were at the beginning, and their confidence level, of course, at the beginning of this invasion, um, is not the same that we are seeing now because of course with obvious obvious trends. Uh, that have been going on, uh, we know that you know Russia is suffering some setbacks, and um, perhaps this could be the beginning of the end of this invasion. Hopefully, we'd we'll like to appreciate your time on the program. Dr. Michael Ugu is a senior lecturer, at political science department with Babcock University. It was a pleasure having you join us. Thank you so much, Miss Thank you. And President Volodymyr Zelensky is marked Ukraine's Defenders Day holiday, promising victory over Russia. The Ukrainian leader said that by defeating Russia, Ukraine will respond to all enemies who encroach on the country, adding that this will be a victory for all people. <laughs> President Zelensky laid a wreath with the yellow and blue colors of the Ukrainian flag in front of a memorial in the capital, Kyiv, dedicated to soldiers killed on the front lines since 2014, when Russia first invaded and annexed Crimea. He vowed that everything that had been taken away from Ukraine would be returned and no soldier left in captivity. Ukrainian forces have made advances in recent weeks, but Russia has carried out heavy airstrikes in the past few days.